Our primary point of contact with the church is the Sunday morning worship gathering. I have grown up in church, so I've sat through church services for 29 years, and if you count when mom was pregnant, 30 years. From Hurricane First Baptist, to Liberty Community Church, to a mega church in Charlotte, to this church in Charleston, I've been in a lot of worship services. In all of those we've sang, for the most part, someone has preached, and sometimes other stuff happens, depending on the church and depending on the service. Maybe there are prayers, offerings, recitation of creeds, baptisms, the Lord's Supper, announcements even. Here at Resurrection, for example, we have embraced some elements in our services that, that many churches in our tradition have not typically embraced. We recite creeds, we confess sin, we observe the Eucharist weekly, we respond to a call to worship at the beginning and close our services with the doxology. Some of these things can feel very different and are a little jarring, but other things are just subtly different. Some people like the service, others don't really like it. Which leads to questions that we should ask, and, and questions that I'm not sure many folks do ask. Questions like, are, is the whole point of this like to find what people like and do it as good as you can until the room fills up? Like, are we just supposed to do that? Like, why do we do what we do on Sunday mornings? What do the scriptures teach about the worship of God's people? What must we do? Like what's essential or commanded? And what's optional? Like maybe it's cultural or just an issue of preference. And what's the point of those things? Like what's supposed to happen? What do these things accomplish? And if I don't go, if I'm not a part of it, if I don't gather for worship, what am I missing or what is not happening in my life that God intends to happen. Maybe you'd ask these questions, maybe you've never asked them. These questions are both deeply theological, yet intensely practical. I am just convinced that recovering a robust, biblical, theological understanding of worship will lead to the renewal of the church in our day. I am just convinced that recovering a robust, biblical, theological view of worship, understanding of worship, commitment to worship, will lead to the renewal of the church in our day. Sometimes we need to think about mission, about going and doing and how to go and do, but we must not forget, as one famous pastor has quipped, that, that mission exists because worship does not, meaning the point of mission, the point of going and sharing and serving, the point of all of this is that the nations would worship the triune God of scriptures. Here is the big idea for us this morning as we kick off this new series, Preaching Through the Service. Christian worship remembers, rehearses, and anticipates the story of God in the world. That's the big idea. That's what we're going to zone in this morning. And it's a, it's a somewhat interesting statement. I think that by the end, it'll make a lot of sense to you. Christian worship remembers, rehearses, and anticipates the story of God in the world. Brothers and sisters, worship is not where God joins our story. It's where we join God's story. Here, together, we behold him. We ascribe worth to him, the root of the English term that we use for worship, worth-ship. And together, here, we are shaped for a life of loving service in the kingdom of God, for the glory of God, and the life of the world. I pray, church, this morning and in the mornings that are to come, that we would see the beauty and majesty of Christian worship. And I pray you find that compelling. I pray you would sense the presence of God in this place as his people gather to worship him on this Lord's day. Why in the world do we do the things we do on Sunday morning?
Now, I want to be clear of a couple things. First, I am the, the lead pastor of this church, so uh, I'm providing instruction from the scriptures and teaching and correction for us. And nothing I say this week or in the next week are, are meant to be taken as a, a dig at, at those who see worship differently. Um, if that were the case, then the scriptures would have much to say about our hearts not being in the right place, even though maybe our forms are where they should be. So that's the first sort of, um, what's the word, uh, editorial comment. The second editorial comment is, and I'm not exhausting the topic, like we are not saying everything there is to say about Christian worship, but this is certainly a start. The title of this morning's sermon is Worship and the Story of God. The first point we'll make is worship remembers God's story. Worship remembers God's story. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's use Jesus' Bible. Let's use the Bible of the apostles, the Old Testament. You cannot understand New Testament worship if you don't understand the foundation of Old Testament worship. The roots of Christian worship lie deep in the Old Testament with Abraham himself. Abraham, that wandering nomad, that father to the nation of Israel, he built altars and offered sacrifices wherever God appeared to him. Jump from Abraham to our next great leader, Moses. In Moses' day, the tabernacle was a portable sanctuary. Moses was the first church planter, right? A portable sanctuary for the Israelite tribes journeying through the wilderness. There, the presence of God would come to the people of God. Sometime later, Solomon founded a lavish temple in Jerusalem that lasted more than three centuries until the Babylonians destroyed it in 586 BC. When the Jews return home from exile, they'll build a new temple, less splendid than the great, and it'll serve in the center of worship until Jesus' day, when Herod the Great, when it will be destroyed by the Romans, rather, in, in AD 70. From the beginning of scriptures, we see chosen people meeting God in sacred space. From the beginning of scriptures, we see chosen, called out people meeting God in dedicated, sacred space space. Now, when we survey the theology or the knowledge of God that undergirds what happens in this worship, in the tabernacle, in the altars of dirt from Abraham, and in the temple, I am struck by the centrality of God's call to remember. The centrality of God's call to remember. Let's just consider Deuteronomy. Let's look at a passage of scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 20 through 25. Let me read that, uh, and let's read that together. When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we, are, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and grievous, against Egypt and against Pharaoh and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from there that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do all this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Here, God does not call his people to remember their worship. No, he calls them to remember his saving acts. Remember his saving acts. Here's what he's teaching. He's saying, when your children ask you, why do we go to this thing? Why do we eat this thing? Why do we pray this way? Why do we dress this way? Why do we think this way? Why do we live this way? When your children ask you why we keep the commands and statutes of the Lord our God, this is what you'll tell them. 
the Bible says. You will tell them that we do this because we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt and God has called us out of there. We do these things to remember where we were and remember our God who has saved us. Why do we do all this? Why do we live this way? Son, daughter, I'm glad you asked because we must never forget what the Lord has done for us. The theology of Deuteronomy will undergird the worship of Leviticus. And one of the things that I, we cannot miss is the centrality of the command to remember. Remember how God appeared you before, you, bef remember how God appeared you in his, before his awesome presence at Mount Horeb, Deuteronomy 4. Remember how he redeemed you from slavery in Egypt, Deuteronomy 5, 15, 16, 24. Remember the power by which he humbled Pharaoh. Remember how he provided for you in the desert for 40 years, Deuteronomy 8. Remember how he gives you the ability to produce wealth as he swore to your forefathers, Deuteronomy 8. Remember how God gives you the land because of who he is, not because of what you've done, chapter 9. Remember how God showed you his mighty deeds before your very eyes, chapter 11. Remember the haste and affliction of your God's Passover, chapter 16. Remember God's power to afflict and to heal, chapter 24. Remember the days of old, chapter 32. Teach your children to remember the saving work of God. But worship in Israel happened in the home, but it, it happened on a broader scale. It happened at a national level as well. God instituted a, a calendar with seven feasts that order his people's worship in time. This is where the early church got the idea for a church calendar, by the way. In each of the feasts that God has ordained, Israel is remembering and anticipating the story of God. For example, in Passover, what's the point? To remember God's deliverance from Egypt. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, what's the point? To remember the escape from Egypt and God's provision of bread. The Feast of First Fruits, what's the point? To remember that God is the one who gives the harvest, so we give first to him. The Feast of Weeks, to remember the giving of the law at Sinai. Rosh Hashanah, to remember God's judgment and anticipate the judgment day that looms ahead. Yom Kippur, to seek the forgiveness of God. A scapegoat is sacrifice for the sins of the nation, to re remember our sin and remember God's holiness. And finally, the Feast of Tabernacles, or booths, to remember when the Jewish people lived in the wilderness, in tents, before entering the promised land. Biblical people worship God by remembering his work in history. That pattern continues into the New Testament. Consider Mary's Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord. Why? Because he has done great things for me. He has been faithful to his promises. His mercy extends to all generations who fear him. He is a promise-keeping God. Consider Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit to birth the church. The very first Christian sermons on that day and after, they call their hearers to remember that former times have been fulfilled in Jesus, that in him a new era has dawned, and that we should all repent and believe in him. In Acts 5, Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. In Jesus the Christ, the story of God reaches its climax. Worship remembers God's story, and God's story finds its climax in the person and work of Jesus Christ. This is what's new at Pentecost. The clarity that is preached, the clarity that this 
is God's plan. The Messiah has come, Peter says, and you guys killed him. But the God of our fathers, note the past orientation, has raised him from the dead. God has so acted in this way. In light of what God has done in raising Jesus from the dead, here is the call to repent and believe. This is the challenge of those early Christian sermons. Respond to Jesus, the revelation of God. Worship in the Bible is our response to God's revelation. Worship in the Bible, that's important if you're taking notes, is our response to God's revelation. We cannot know God unless he makes himself known to us. We cannot know God unless he makes himself known to us. And he makes himself known to us in history, in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the yes to all of God's promises. God has kept his promise to Adam, to Abraham, to Jacob, to Moses, and to David. Old Testament worship was looking back to the exodus from Egypt and looking forward to a greater exodus. It looked back to a God who redeems his people while anticipating the same God redeeming the whole world. God is glorified when we remember and recall all he is and all he's done for us. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the climax of the story of God, this is the foundation of Christian worship. The Christ event is our exodus. The Christ event is the center of our story. Mom, dad, why do we go to church? Mom, dad, why do we celebrate Easter and Christmas. Mom, dad, why do we live this way instead of this way? Mom, dad, why do we do all of this? We do it because Jesus, the son of God, has come to seek and save the lost. We do it because we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but now God has made us alive together with him. We do it because we were slaves to sin, and now we are free in him. Jesus the Christ has saved us from our sins. He has freed us from death, hell, and the grave. He has brought us into the family of God. We remember God's work in history. We respond to him in worship. But how? How does worship remember God's story? Our second point, worship rehearses God's story. Worship remembers God's story and worship rehearses God's story. How do we remember God's story, week in and week out? Short answer, the service and everything we do in it. How do we over and over again remember the story of God in our lives? Primary way, the Lord's Day service and all the stuff we do in it. Now this is where we're going over the next several weeks and I can frankly hardly contain my excitement. The service itself tells a story. The stuff that we do tells the gospel story. We remember corporately and together as one people with one voice and one mind and one heart. We remember what God has done and anticipate what he will do. When we preach, we preach from the Bible. The very word of God. God's revelation to us. Our preaching and receiving this revelation and our response to it is worship. We don't stop worshiping when we stop singing. We continue to worship, though it takes a different form. Speaking of singing, when we sing, like the psalmist, we recount the mighty works of God. We glory in the one who has made himself known to us by singing what we know to be true about it. And we focus our hearts and minds together on it. When we confess our sins, we are rehearsing the law and the gospel. We remember how short we fall and we remember that the mercy of God is ours. We need to be reminded that if we cannot be marked by perfection, we must be marked by repentance. In a world who's never wrong, we are people who admit that we are so often wrong. We need to be reminded that we need the righteousness of Christ. When we've confessed the creed, we remember what the church has taught for 2,000 years. We confess that we believe this to be the true story of the whole world. How crazy is that? That when we confess the creed, we are saying that this whole story ends with the resurrection of the dead. How profoundly beautiful. This instills hope in us in our darkest days. On the days you come to church and you're not feeling it. 
You're not in a good mood. It's not the best week of your life. You can't grin and bear it. When the creed is recited and you hear that you believe in the resurrection of the dead, even in our desperation, in our darkness, the light of hope still shines. When we pray, we pray with expectation that the God who has been faithful in the past will continue to be faithful in the future, answering the prayers that we bring him in faith. When we take the Lord's Supper, we remember and proclaim the death of Christ until he comes. Paul says that verbatim to the church of Corinth. When we eat the bread and drink the juice, we are rehearsing the story of Christ's passion as he has instructed us to do. When we sing the doxology at the end of the service, we remind ourselves where the whole story ends and the worship of the triune God. In this sure and steady hope, then, we send one another out into the world as agents of reconciliation in a world of strife, as agents of peace in a world of chaos, and as agents of hope in a world of despair. Christian worship remembers and rehearses God's story. We will really dig in here over the next few weeks, considering the biblical commands and patterns that inform our worship services. But it's worth saying this morning that Christian worship does not just look backwards. The third and final point for our morning. Worship anticipates God's story. Worship remembers God's story. Worship rehearses God's story. And Christian worship anticipates God's story. Our remembering the past is tied to our living in the present and the future. I'll cite just one example, 1 Peter chapter 2. Feel free to flip over there if you have your Bible. I'll just be reading verses 9 through 12, so um, just lean in. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Why? That you may worship him, Peter says. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his glorious light. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, so that you may worship him. How? By proclaiming that he has called us out of darkness and glorious light. If we're using our sermon as a guy, we can just say by remembering what he's done for us. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And then this discussion of worship leads directly to a discussion of ethics. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they'll actually see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. You are chosen by God to worship him. Remember who you were. There it is again. You are not a people. You are a people. You had not received mercy. You have received mercy. In light of that, here's the command. I urge you not to give in to the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. I urge you to keep, the way, keep your way of life among the outsiders, among the Gentiles. Keep your way of life honorable. Not only Peter says this, consider the writer of Hebrews. He says in the 13th chapter, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, through Jesus, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Here's what that says. Here we have no lasting city. Let us, through Jesus, offer a sacrifice. What is the sacrifice that we offer? The sacrifice that we offer is, is our praise, the text says, 
the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. And then that leads immediately to a discussion of ethics again. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices, worship language, intentionally worship language, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. This is what's pleasing to God, the fruit of lips who praise him, your sacrifice of praise, and your sacrifice of loving service. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have. Offer a sacrifice of praise and offer a sacrifice of loving service through Jesus who has sacrificed himself for us, fulfilling the Old Testament vision of worship. Here's what we gotta see before we leave. Your worship informs the rest of your life. What happens in here affects what happens out there. This is a very biblical idea. Worship is meant to shape us for a life of loving service to God and the world. What does God tell his people through his prophets? The ones who do all the worship stuff in the religious settings right, but who treat people poorly and with disdain. Oh, he says, I hate your music. <laughs> I hate your feasts. I hate your sacrifices, God says to people who worship him with their mouth, but not with their lives. In fact, he says it rises to heaven and it smells terrible. Now this gets misquoted all the time. People who are against any sort of order say, you know, it's not about what you do, it's about what's in here. That's true, it's not about what you do, it's about what's in here. But are the ceremonies the problem? No, because who ordained the ceremonies? God did, God did. Their sinful hearts are the problem. God desires worship in spirit and truth in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The fact that worship is spiritual does not negate the importance of externals, of liturgy and order and feast days and holy days. It just reminds us that none of those externals are the point. The point's not just showing up here on Sunday morning. The point's not just being a part of the life of the church in other ways. The point is not just showing up at Christmas or Easter. The point is not just doing these celebrations. The point is a heart that knows and loves and obeys God. Hearts that are not in worship, inside bodies that are going through the motions of worship, is an abomination to God. Don't just go through the motions. A theologian Yaroslav Pelikan has said that tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Christian worship is living worship. It's alive. It's the living faith of the dead. Living worship is transformational. It shapes us to take part in the unfolding story of God. Christian worship shows us what is to come and shepherds us in that direction. It is in Christian worship that God's vision for the world is made known. Here, our hearts and minds are filled with truth. We are reminded of God's overarching story, and we are filled with hope as we look to the end. And not only are we reminded of what's to come, but we are called to shape each other for the journey. Just before that passage in Hebrews, the writer is speaking about Jesus as the fulfillment of our Old Testament worship. And he uses this covenantal language, do not neglect the gathering of the saints, do not neglect meeting together, as some, he says, are in the habit of doing. But build one another up, spur one another on to love and good deeds. Because what happens is, when you're not rehearsing God's story, you're just living your own story. When you're not centering your life on the story of God, you're centering your life on something else. When God is not the object of our worship like something else is, worship is inevitable. The question is only who or what will we worship? Worship team, come on up. Brothers and sisters, you'll see in the weeks to come, as we think about prayers and creeds and confessions and the communion table and 
all these elements of worship that are in the Bible and appear throughout church history. We're not retrieving these things to be trendy or cool. It's not. We're not retrieving these things so we can return to some mythical golden age of the church. This may sound surprising coming from me who esteems tradition so highly, but older is not necessarily inherently better. We are retrieving the riches from the great tradition because we need the wisdom of the past to navigate uncharted waters in the future. Brothers and sisters, when we gather here on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, rehearsing the resurrection over and over and over again, when we gather here, when we rehearse the resurrection every Sunday, when we rehearse the gospel story, when we remember the powerful works of God, when we respond to the revelation of God, something profound happens. The living God himself meets us here. The living God himself, scripture teaches, dwells among his people. Here is the profundity of what Paul notes, that he is taking us and he's making us living stones, laid on the foundation of Jesus, the cornerstone. Here's what he means. His hearers would know the temple is the place where you go and meet with God. And he's saying that the church is becoming that place where God comes to meet with his people. You are like living stones laid brick by brick on the foundation of Christ, the cornerstone. And it is here that God meets with us in a special and unique way. Brothers and sisters, this vision for worship is a corrective that we so desperately need. I believe three great enemies have stormed our midst. If you're taking notes as we conclude, these three great enemies have distorted our vision and experience and expectations of worship. The enemies of narcissism, the enemy of consumerism, and the enemy of pragmatism. Narcissism is not interested in immersing ourselves in God's story. Worship as God's story, what in the world is the good of that? What's the point of that? It's not about me, my life, my family, my job, my success. We don't want that much God. We just want enough God. Services aren't about God, they're about us. This idea is fundamentally narcissistic. And if it's about us, then we have it our way. We get what we want all the time. Or we hold the church hostage until we do. I want songs I like. I want no rituals. I want a five minute sermon. I want the best musicians in the city. And I want the best facilities out there. And if we're not careful, we can accommodate a narcissistic, consumeristic world with pragmatism. We don't design our services around the story of God. We design our services around the whims of the masses. We design our services around our market. Whatever's going to get and keep hind ends in seats. The vision for Christian worship we've seen this morning fights back on all three fronts. It's God's story, not ours. Checkmate narcissism. Consumerism gives way to participation. I know this is what you think you want, but let me show you something better. Steve Jobs, CEO of Apple, rest in peace, had a vision that all these people would want computers. And his competitors said, why? They don't want com- They don't want computers. Computers are for like techie people. Let's have an open system where techie people can play with computers. And he says, no, 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 we want a closed system where anyone and their grandma can open a computer and be able to use it. Because Steve Jobs understood that people don't necessarily know what they want until you show them. 
And Christian worship is meant to be a compelling picture of the story of God. It's supposed to show us what we should want so that we can reorient our desires around the gospel. I know this is what you think you want, but let me show you something better. Narcissism gives way to God-centeredness. Consumerism gives way to participation in the story of God. And pragmatism gives way to beauty. I pray that this morning is foundational for us. I pray that the rest of the series, as we consider the things that we do on Sunday mornings, how we're remembering, rehearsing, and anticipating the story of God, I pray that this just fills your heart with appreciation for worship. It fills your mind with a commitment to worship. That we would understand our stories as part of God's unfolding story. Let's pray and then we'll remember and rehearse and proclaim the gospel by coming to the Lord's table. Father, we repent of the ways that we have made worship about us. We repent of the ways that we have made out of worship a show. And we come humbly to you this morning asking you to use us in your story. Father, immerse us in your story. Let your story be the oxygen that we breathe, the way we understand our lives and all that we are called to be and do. Help us remember your mighty deeds. Help us anticipate future showings of your great power. And help us live holy lives of love in the present. Father, give this church a vision for Christian worship that is rooted in the scriptures, that is informed by the great tradition, the communion of saints, but it is not living in the past, that is vibrant, that is real, that is alive, It flowers into beauty here in the present. Help us be a people whose worship is attractive to our city. Not because we're necessarily good at all the forms or the best in the world, but because we remember, we rehearse, and we proclaim the story of you making all things new through Jesus, the chosen one. Father, may that vision of worship compel us to gather and to be a part of what you're doing in our city, in our state, and among the nations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.